Hey guys, what is up? Super K-Man Rocks here, and I am here for my LEC Spring Playoffs round number two and round number three overview and analysis video. Of course, there's a lot of games and series to cover today. We usually go weekend by weekend when it comes to the LEC, but they wanted to switch up the schedule for some reason this split as opposed to what they've done not only last split but last year as well and include basically every single series leading up to the semifinals in one weekend. So we have the end of round number two, the end of the lower bracket. That means we're going to figure out the two teams that end up making top four from the lower bracket, as we already know, G2 and BDS won their sides of the bracket, got their way into winner's finals. We will be figuring out, you know, who ends up joining them in the top four. We will, of course, also be covering that winner's finals matchup as well as the other best of five on the lower side of the bracket to see who is making the semifinals here as well. So two best of threes and two best of fives covered in today's video. It's going to be a good one, a longer one. If you guys are excited, let me know down in the comment section below. What did you think was going to happen in these four series that we're going to be covering today. Did you think they would go the way that they ended up going, or were there any surprises? Would love to know your thoughts and opinions down below. Of course, if you want to know my thoughts, you can check out my round one analysis up in the iCard right now. That's every single playoff series in this spring split gone over uh, up until this point, up until the start of the series today, and so that's going to be a pretty useful resource if you are at all interested, I would say, in you know where these series came from and, and how these teams got here, but today we are going to be going over, like I said, the final two best of threes and then the two best of fives formats going to be a bit different because best of threes are going to still be covered in one kind of go we're going to cover it in one slide we're going to kind of talk about the whole series as a whole I'll give a player of the series and a dud of the series for the two series and then once we get into the best of fives then we will start covering them game by game so winners finals that uh, fourth place matchup you know lower bracket round three whatever you want to classify it as those two series will be covered game by game and of course we will be giving a player of the game and a dud of the game for each individual game once we get to the best of fives as well as a player of the series at the end. And so, of course, at the end of the episode, we are going to know our top three teams. We're going to know uh, essentially who's in play to make it to MSI and also who is going to have guaranteed themselves a spot in the finals as well. So a lot to cover today, but we have to start it off with the best of threes, the back half of the best of three section here in the playoffs. And we kick that off with the upper bracket matchup. This one to me was a lot closer and a lot more interesting than the lower bracket matchup, at least on paper. It was the number one seeded Fnatic taking on the number four seeded Team Heretics. And it is going to be Fnatic taking the 2 1 series win, knocking Heretics out of the playoffs. Remember, both of these teams having expended their extra life at different intervals, at different stages. Fnatic was, I would say, the favorite. I think a lot of people considered them the favorite going into this series, and they did make the most of that. But they won in pretty untraditional ways for them. Again, actually able to play through bot lane, which has been a big strength for them recently. Certainly not something that has been a strength for them throughout the entirety of this year, but their bot lane absolutely gapped Heretics bot lane, and I think that's really where you're going to be looking at the negatives for Heretics coming out of this series. Outside of that, though, there were some good performances from players on Heretics. We'll talk about those individually, but starting with Fnatic, player of the series as a whole, both for Game 2, Game 3, really just everything that this team did is absolutely going to be Noah in the bot lane. Like I said, the bot gap between these two teams was probably the most noticeable difference between both of them in this series. Series, and that is just a general positive note, I would say, overall for Fnatic. They've been playing through jungle mid throughout the entirety of this year leading up until this point. Razork and Humanoid have really been the focal point for the offense that they have wanted to run. And when they're winning, then this team's really unstoppable when they're losing. When Razork has a couple of bad games like he did in the final week of the regular season, this team does struggle a bit more. So it's nice to see that that alternative win condition of the bot lane is actually starting to figure itself out. When Razork was struggling, Noah and June actually started to pick up the pace. I talked about how I think both of them played their best games of the year in the back half of the season, and both of them have been very good in the best of three stage up until this point. Not only that, but they were good in the best of three stage last split as well. It feels like when these games get more important for this team, they start to lock in and play a little bit better. I think Noah in particular had some phenomenal positioning throughout this series. The Jinx, the Zeri, both of them were really excellent in games two and three. It really was the Jinx that was able to take over that third and final game and end up winning it. For Fnatic, you invested a lot of resources and eventually kind of got out of control. You were never going to be able to win a 5v5 if you were heretics on the other side of it. So 
credit to Fnatic for knowing their win condition and being able to execute on it, but they don't actually get there if it's not for June. I think Noah is a clear player of the game for me in game number three, but June in game number two was excellent on the Alistair. We'll get into what happened when those roles flipped to the other team, the Alistair, uh, you know, when we get into game three, four heretics, but June was excellent in that second game, and I truly do believe that this one to two week stretch for June right now is the best that he has ever played in the entirety of his career, going back to the LCK, you know, even going back to Challengers League, he never really was a guy who was able to take over with his engages. He was always just relatively fine, a pretty much kind of a jack of all trades, master of none type of player that just really wasn't mechanically talented enough to be able to keep up with like top LCK supports, which is why he was really bad in that region. But put him on something like Alistair and, you know, have him go up against a Team Heretics team that isn't exactly killing it in the bot lane, or at least they weren't in this series. They had been, I would say, leading up until this series, but certainly didn't in this series. And he can actually look very good. I think he's finally starting to come into his own in terms of confidence getting to play with another Korean in the bot lane here in Noah. So the bot lane looking great. Humanoid was also really good here. The Aurelian Soul in game three is just this inevitable win condition. The thing does so much damage in late game team fights. The only reason he's not getting player of the series or, or even a nod for player of the game here is because I don't think that the Oriana or the Talia were necessarily like dominant games. I think the Aurelian Soul was really the only great game that Humanoid had in this series, but he still was super important in that game number three. As soon as this game starts scaling into the late game, a soul is just inevitable. There's really nothing you can do to stop him. Razork and Oscar were generally fine, certainly better, I would say, than their counterparts on the other side of this matchup, because Wunder and Yankos were just not very good. But Noah and June were definitely the primary win conditions for this team throughout their two wins in games two and three, and then Humanoid obviously stepping up in that third and final game to get them into a good spot. But for Heretics, this is a sad way to go out. This team continues to look kind of fine. I mean, theoretically, I think you can make an argument that they are a top four team. They were able to take a game off of Fnatic, and it just was a relatively rough draw, all things considered, because now you're sitting at a spot where, like, you have to beat one of the best teams in the entire league because of the way that this bracket ended up working out. It is really unfortunate, and it's really uh, just kind of unlucky for them, I would say, overall, but they had an opportunity to win this series, and they just weren't able to get over the hump that was Fnatic. Dead of the series is pretty obviously going to go to Trimby in the support position. That Alistair game in Game 3 was miserable, constantly going in and constantly dying, constantly being out of position. This is one of the worst games that Trimby has played. You would think he is still on Fnatic's payroll with the way he played here, that he wanted to give his former bot lane partner in Noah a free win in this series, because truly his Alistair was horrendous. It's one of the worst games that I've seen Trimby play, and it's a really bad time for that to happen. He's obviously a lot better and a lot more comfortable on these enchanters. It's always kind of been his MO. He's not really a roamer. He's not really somebody who likes to play the macro game as much. He likes to be a little bit more focused on the 2v2 in the bot lane, trying to take over and, and get his AD carry in particular ahead, and it just wasn't really the style that I think this team wanted to go towards. Now, Flacken was also not very good in this series, significantly worse than Noah on the other side of the matchup, even when he was able to receive resources. He just didn't play the Jinx all that well in game two. The Varus was kind of useless in game three. I just don't think this bot lane played well at all, and that was a, a really big indictment, and in my opinion, the biggest reason why Heretics lost this series. Wunder and Yankos, when you're looking at top and looking at jungle, just outplayed by Oscar and Razork on the other side. I don't even I don't even think Oscar and Razork were perfect for Fnatic, but they were certainly better, in my opinion, than what Wunder and Yankos offered for Heretics. The only real positive, I would say, is Viru was excellent in this series. He truly was 1v9-ing in a lot of circumstances. Azir is one of those champions that can do that, whether you're building damage or whether you're building tank. You can kind of do whatever you want on that champion. You can be the primary facilitator and playmaker. You can be the backline carry. The only problem is that sometimes, you know, players run into that LEC Azir syndrome that I always talk about where they feel like they have to make this big Shareem and Shuffle play and they end up, you know, trading one for one or, or two for two. And, you know, as the primary damage dealer here in game number three, that can be a bit of a problem. But I think for the most part, Zviru was very, very, very good in this series. Definitely the best player on Heretics. And he has really justified, I would say, his call up. I know it certainly was kind of a weird circumstance that got him onto this team in the first place because it didn't really feel all that right generally, but he has, I guess, made the most of it in his time here. But unfortunately, that's going to be it for Heretics' split. They are not going to be making MSI. They are going to be finishing in fifth, sixth place, you know, tied with whoever ends up losing the series next. It's certainly not ideal, but I guess it is an improvement over what they were in winter, so at least there's movement in a positive direction, but this team just continues to underperform what their expectations are. This is a top four, three, even two team on paper, and they're just not able to execute on that. But for Fnatic, they make their way into the top four. They do get into the best 
to five stage, it would have been a disaster as the number one seed if you didn't get that. So congratulations to them. Botlane's playing great, but I think if they really do want to get over the top, it does have to be everybody. Oscar still concerns me, and Razork and Humanoid haven't been as dominant, I would say, in the past two to three weeks as they were in Winter Split. So a lot of things still need to go right for this team, but at least we know they have alternate win conditions now. Then moving on to our second of the best of threes, the other series that will determine the team taking on Fnatic in that best of five stage. It's, of course, a matchup between the number two seeded Team Vitality and the number seven seeded Mad Lions Koi. And Vitality is going to pick up the win. You know, there was some concern because of just generally the way that the LEC goes that Mad Lions was going to struggle very much so against G2, kind of get destroyed in round one, go to the lower bracket, barely get by a team of Giant X that they are significantly more talented than, and then go into a series against Vitality and just kind of win because that's how the LEC works. These teams just don't really have any sort of consistency. The teams that step up in the playoffs seem to have some sort of voodoo magic, and Mad Lions has always been an org like that, and even this team, I think, has carried over a lot of that, especially from what we saw in winter, but nope, Vitality is the better team, and they went out and proved it in this series, thank God, because I was really concerned that MDK was going to have an opportunity to make MSI, and I just don't think this team is good enough to be able to perform at that level. I think that they have proven that pretty clearly over the course of the spring split here, but let's talk about Vitality first and foremost. They are going to make the top four, you know, great to them. I, I don't know if they're guaranteed to be like a top four team in terms of execution. Like, do I think they're definitely better than a team like Team Heretics? I don't really know. I think they're probably in a very similar conversation, uh, but whatever you want to say, they got the easier draw here, and they were able to go by. Uh, player of the series, pretty obviously for me, is going to go to Photon. You know, big ups to Karzi and Hillisang, who I think played really well for a majority of this series, and big ups to VTO, who I thought played really well for a lot of this series. Even Daglas, I think, had a couple of really good moments on the rel, but this was Photon's series, and he is the best top laner in the LEC at the current moment. I gave that distinction to Adam, and I still really like Adam, especially now that BDS is starting to figure things out again. I think Adam all he has proven is that so long as he is in basically any matchup that he is even remotely comfortable in, even if it's a losing matchup, he is going to be entirely relevant in the game and he's going to be able to take over in the mid to late game. Photon is a very similar case. This guy just wins lane. It doesn't even really matter who he's going up against. Two games of Twisted Fate, being able to control the side lanes, being super relevant, even in objective fights, it's something that can be kind of hard for TF players. And so to see Photon come out and just be super relevant, super good in this series, it's not surprising because he's been so good over the course of this year, but it is really encouraging to see. He is the best player on Vitality, and he continues to prove it. But like I said, everybody else was relatively good. Karzi and Hilly were good for the most part. A uh, very funny moment in game number two where Hilly essentially gets himself executed in order to get one auto attack on the tower to try and get the plate. Doesn't get the plate, but gets executed. It's just the most Hillisang play in the entire universe, and it was really funny to watch. But outside of that, Hilly was excellent on both the Rakan and the Tom really making the most, I would say, of a lot of his more aggressive engages and doing a good job of protecting Karzi in the back half of game number two. But, you know, Karzi, all he needs is some setup. Sometimes he can be very inconsistent. There are going to be games that he just insta-loses for your team because that's just Karzi. You have to live with that. It's the reason it's really impossible for me to consider him the best AD carry in Europe. But when he wins, he wins. And he, he can do a lot of really good things. He's still very talented and he is very good from ahead. He can just sometimes, you know, in the early game away, which is not ideal. And then VTO was also very good here. We'll get to Frescali, but Frescali was probably the best player on MDK's side in this series. Outside of that, VTO was still very, very good. Silas, Oriana, I'm really excited to potentially see Silas come back into the meta. I think it's a lot stronger than people are giving it credit for at the current moment. I know the numbers aren't great, but he still beats a lot of the champions that are pretty meta right now, so that'll be interesting. Daglas had a couple of good setup moments. Vitality just generally looked very cohesive and very strong. A couple of weird mistakes here or there, but it's Vitality. You're always going to live on the edge of danger, but their mechanical talent was able to push them over a team that is just not as good as them in Mad Lions Koi. You know, for as much as we hype them up in winter for a lot of the good things and the developments that they had. They're just not all that great of a team right now. I think as the league has gotten more consistent, as teams have gotten better, they've kind of fallen back down to where they naturally were. I think they are about as good as they were in winter. I just think basically everybody else in the league has gotten better, and they have not. They have kind of stayed at that level. A lot of that might be the fact that a lot of these players have played together before, and so that inbuilt synergy was already kind of helping them, but uh, for whatever reason, I, I just don't think they've been able to make those next level adjustments, and I think their win-loss record has definitely hurt because of that. Dead of the series is going to go to Merwin, 
trend for me in the top lane. Two games of RE top, I don't really love RE top, man. And if you are going to play it, then maybe when a champion is completely immobilized, you can actually hit the charm to keep them CC. That would be really nice. Um, he was doing damage. Like, you can definitely give him a positive for that. But outside, I mean, like, really, he made a couple of really big misplays. And I think the champion itself really was not helping this team win. Uh, this is an example to me of something that is just overcooking. I understand that Mirwin is just not particularly consistent on champions that are actual top laners, especially the more common counters to things like Twisted Fate. I understand that Ari generally is considered good into TF, but it's not as good in the top lane. One of the big benefits of Ari is how mobile she can be in the mid game, how she can, you know, shove the lane and roam around and help out the jungle. You just can't really do that nearly as well from the top side of the map. And Mirwin, I think, overcooked on this one. It did not work, and he didn't look very practiced on this champion either. I think Supa and Alvaro were also not particularly great. Supa was definitely not as good as Karzi on the other side, at least in terms of the ability to capitalize on the resources he was able to get. And Alvaro made a couple of really key mistakes, I would say, at the end of game number two. But, you know, everybody else was fine. El Yoya could have been a lot more active, but I don't think he entered the game away or the series away. I just don't think he did a lot of good for the team. And Frascawi, like I said, was pretty clearly the best player on Mad Lions in this series. He has been pretty consistent for this team throughout this year, but it just didn't matter. The talent gap, like I said, between these two teams was simply just too big and, and it was too much for MDK to overcome. They're going to finish in fifth, sixth. They're not going to MSI, which is fine. You're not concerned about that if you're Mad Lions. I think it's better that this team isn't going international, even though they made the finals in the winter split. I think this is a lot more realistic towards what the expectations for this team should be moving forward. But for Vitality, nice win here. You've got yourself into the top four. Anything can happen from here. You have by far the hardest road of anybody left in the top four to potentially make MSI, to make an international tournament. But I think if this team even just makes like top two, if they make the finals, I think they're going to be very happy with that result, even if it doesn't kind of culminate in an international tournament. Overall, top four is definitely going to be considered a positive for a team in an org that has really struggled to get there in the past couple of years. But now that we are done with our best of threes, it's time to move into our two best of fives that we are going to be covering in today's video. Of course, that means we are transitioning from talking about the series as a whole to talking about each game individually. And there is really not a series that is going to be more important than this one in today's video because this is winner's finals. The winner of this will qualify for the LEC finals. Depending on who it is, they could qualify for MSI. You know, one of these teams already is qualified for MSI, so certainly not a lot to lose for them there, but I'm excited to see what ends up happening. It's, of course, a matchup between the number three seeded G2 Esports and the number five seeded Team BDS. Very different paths, I would say, to get here. Both of them were good in the regular season. G2 was certainly better in the regular season. BDS struggled a little bit out of the gate. Obviously, they made a change at the end of the last split. Adam, for whatever reason, was taking out of the taken out of the lineup, whether you want to believe it was a disagreement with just the coach or something bigger than that. Whatever you want to believe, he was benched in a pretty pivotal semifinal matchup against Mad Lions in the previous split. He was returning here to BDS at the start of spring, and things didn't click, I would say, in the same kind of way that they were in previous splits. I think this is the worst that Adam has played in the last year and a half, and that should be pretty indicative, because I really don't even think he's been that bad. He just, he's been excellent over the past year and a half, and I don't think he was excellent at the beginning of this split, but they have started to figure things out. The end of the regular season was incredibly successful for them, and they were awesome in the playoffs. They took down some really good teams. Team Heretics in the first round. They took down Vitality in the second round. These are genuinely good teams. And I think moving forward, you just want to see that same level of aggressiveness. I think when you're looking at players that have stepped up recently that need to continue to step up, you're looking at the jungle mid duo here for BDS. Because Adam, you know, while he's not been perfect recently, you can relatively rely on him in pretty big moments. He has never been a player to shy away from the major spotlight. He was awesome at Worlds, easily the best player on BDS this past year. And I think generally he's been the most consistent member of BDS over the past year. And then you look at LeBrov and Ice, they've been very consistent, I would say, in the bot lane. And Hans and Mickey have kind of been the weak link for G2, at least recently. Hans has been fine, but Mickey has certainly run into his own problems in terms of being able to survive some bad engages. He was really bad in the final week of the regular season, and that hasn't exactly turned around so far in the playoffs for G2, and so you're looking at Ice and LeBrob as potentially a strength. Adam could potentially be a strength, but Shao and Nuke have been really good in this playoff run up until this point. Nuke I feel pretty good about. The only concern I really have with Nuke, and the reason I'm bringing him up here is not because he has been poor across this year, or even poor at all in the playoff run, but rather there are some voodoo magic that he just does not play well against G2. It seems to be a rather 
I guess, consistent running trend is the word I'm looking for, uh, where he has just not performed well against G2 in pretty pivotal moments. You can look back to last split as a really good example of that, where Caps just kind of decimated him in terms of the 1v1. He's going to need to be better than he was in the winner's finals of winter uh, if this team wants any chance of being able to win this series. And then Sheo, who has been significantly better, I would say, in the back half of this spring split than he has been at any point in the regular season so far. And that is a really good thing to say. He was kind of the weak link in winter to get this team across the finish line. And, you know, he wasn't strong at the start of spring, but the final regular season week here in spring, the playoffs so far, Sheo has been a really big positive influence for BDS. If both of those things end up continuing, if Nuke can, you know, play well against Caps, which is something he has struggled to do, if Sheo can continue the hot streak he's on, I think BDS actually could have a chance to make things interesting. But G2 are going to be pretty big favorites, I would say, in this series regardless, because it's G2 until they're proven to not be the best team in Europe, then you just have to assume that they're going to be the best team in Europe. They have the best players. I mean, Caps is by far the best player in the region. You have someone like Broken Blade who's played really well recently. I'm a big fan of Yike. I think Hans has played well. Even if Mickey X in particular has really struggled in the recent weeks, showing a lot of shades of 2022 Excel Mickey X, there still is more than enough talent on this team for the expectation for them to be for them to cruise to another title. If they don't win the, the split in spring, if they don't win everything in the LEC, that's almost a disappointment, I would say, in terms of their expectations. So they're going to be favorites, but I think BDS could make it interesting. My prediction is still going to be G2-3-1. I really don't see any reason not to predict that. That's what I said in the previous video when I was talking about this series and what to expect. Um, I really don't see any reason not to expect G2 to be better and to be able to make their mark. But is that going to be the case or is BDS going to make it more interesting than maybe I'm anticipating? Well, we of course got to start it off with game number one and the winner of game number one was... G2 Esports. They are going to take the first game of this series. They're going to go up one to nothing. Game one, pretty important to be able to capture, pretty important to be able to establish yourself in, and that's exactly what G2 was able to do here. It's really hard to give nuanced and, you know, critical analysis of games like this because BDS did a lot of things right, and I think they also did a lot of things wrong, but G2 also did a lot of things wrong. I think lucky for them, they just have the best player in the entire region on a champion that is pretty inevitable in the back half of games. He did a very good job of getting himself ahead in the mid game and by the time you hit this you know 35 minute team fight all of a sudden there's just no way to actually be able to stop the big space dragon player of the game in game one is going to go to caps I mean he's gotten so many of these I feel like he's gotten like over 15 across this year so far if you include the individual games in the playoffs it truly is unfair how good caps has been in comparison to everyone else I mean I'm not going to sit here and say that he's guaranteed to be a top 5 to 10 player in the world by the time we hit these major international tournaments but there's just no reason to not believe that he can't be with the way that he is currently operating in the LEC. Aurelian Soul is obviously this champion that you look at as, you know, scaling oriented picks, something that doesn't need to be super aggro in the early to mid game in order for it to be super useful as the game continues to go along. The only problem with giving that over if you're BDS, because I understand the idea that maybe you just want to pressure the early to mid game, you feel like you are going to be able to outdo what G2 is able to do with this more late game comp, the Scion, the A-Soul, the Jinx, a lot of champions that really want to ramp up as the game goes along. I understand the idea, but the problem with that is that if you're not actively better than Caps, then you're not going to be able to pull it off. And unfortunately, you just weren't better than Caps. You didn't rely on the fact that, I mean, you didn't account Count, I should say, for the fact that Caps was just going to get gold in the mid-game anyways on Aurelian Soul because he can do that because he's Caps. And so, you know, obviously credit to Caps. He's excellent. He is ridiculous. He's playing at an unbelievable level right now. And it's the reason that I think there's just nobody in the LEC that can stop G2 because I think Caps single-handedly can beat basically every single team in the entire region. However, it wasn't just him. I think the Scion actually was a pretty positive pick for the team in this game. The Varus was not even tickling the Scion by the time we hit the late game. And yes, you're looking at this comp as a lot more scaling oriented. You're looking at this comp as something that's going to be a lot more, I guess, like focused on those 5v5 team fights. And so something like Scion is going to have the opportunity to get those stacks and to scale into the late game. But Broken Blade, I think has been significantly better in spring than he was in winter. He was not phenomenal for me in winter. He was fine. He was good, especially in the finals. But throughout the entirety of that split, I thought he was just kind of okay. He has been significantly better than that so far in the spring split, and I think this was another good example of just how to pilot something like Scion at a high level. Yike was very good on the rail, consistently good engages. I think Hans and Mickey were fine. They didn't really have to do all that much in this game. You really relied a lot on Aurelian Soul and Scion to be kind of the primary facilitators or, you know, Scion being the primary tank and to attract a lot of attention from BDS and Aurelian Soul to be the big damage dealer with rail kind of being the engaged target here, but G2 generally just, I think, had a really good idea of how they wanted to play out their mid to late game. They allowed the game to go to 
the part of the game they knew they would be a bit stronger at, and they executed on that. So credit to those players, and mostly credit to Caps. And then for BDS, you know, there were some good moments, I would say. Like, I think Nuke was generally fine in this game. Shao was generally fine in this game, and we were talking about how Jungle Mid needed to be positive in order for this team to even really stand a chance in a series like this. Luckily for them, they were relatively positive. The problem was you just didn't have enough damage on this team to actually be able to get through the Scion, even let alone with the Rel plus the Lulu and, you know, all the other things that go along with this comp, and you were dying way too fast to the Aesol in these fights. Dead of the game is going to go to Ice on the Varus. You can point out how the build didn't necessarily help this team, and I agree. The build did not help this team, but the Varus in general, I think, was just very poor. He was doing so little damage in the back half of these games. His positioning was way too passive, was never really in a spot where he could actually keep up with even the Jinx on the other side of this matchup in terms of the aggression that he was showing. I think Ice was just way too scared and way too careful in this game for what the circumstances actually applied. As the Varus, you do want to be pushing your foot on the gas throughout a majority of this early game. You don't want Jinx to be able to outscale you into that late game, especially going into a Scion that is going to kind of nullify you in the back half. He just wasn't useful in any way, shape, or form. I think you could say a similar thing about LeBrav, but at the very least, at least LeBrav was applying CC. He was applying slows. You know, he was doing Ash things. He had the arrows. His positioning was horrible, and he was way too far forward in a lot of circumstances, which is something that LeBrav has had a bit of a problem with, I would say, over the course of the early parts of his career, but the bot lane was kind of a weakness for me here. I don't think Adam was nearly as good on the Aatrox either, especially his Broken Blade on the other side, and so... You are at least a little bit concerned. You're not shocked that this team is going down 0-1. But again, 0-2, down 0-2 against G2, that's a disaster. He, winning three games in a row against this team does feel generally impossible. And so this is a must-win game for BDS in game number two for them to even be able to stay alive, in my opinion, in this series. But G2 could take a commanding lead here and really establish themselves as the front runners in this series, I think, where they expected to be. Can they do that here in this second game? Or is BDS going to be able to tie everything up? Well, the winner of game number two was... BDS. They are going to take game number two. They're going to tie up this series at one apiece. And like I said, a necessary win for this team. You do not want to go down 2-0 to G2. That is a disaster spot to be in. You want to be in a spot where you can at the very least keep up with a team like G2. And winning game number two here does put you in that spot. It now turns into a regular season best of three. I guess it's not a regular season, just a best of three with the best of ones here in the regular season for the LEC. I'm so used to saying that from the LCK and the LPL, but it just turns into a best of three now. And a best of three is winnable by any team. You can win two games in three. Like, G2 has flaws, and they certainly were accentuated, I would say, in this game, where there were a couple of just really, really bad plays that we will talk about from their side, because they're really not all that clinical outside of having a couple of really talented players on this team, which is why I'm a bit concerned about them moving forward internationally. But let's talk about this game in particular. Game number two, player of the game, is going to go to Lebrov for me. Typically speaking, and I talk about this a lot on the channel, Lucian Nami, when it pops off, it's like, oh, Lucian's doing so much, and it looks like Lucian is just absolutely dominating and carrying the game. You know, Nami can really put in a lot of effort and a lot of work in these circumstances. And I think the difference between seeing, like, an okay Nami player and a really good Nami player, a bot lane that is very clearly, like, practiced and experienced on this Lucian Nami duo is very clear. Lebrov was excellent in this game. When you're able to set up bubbles super regularly to catch out important priority targets in teamfights, that's how you know you're playing Nami at a high level. Because Nami is really not a champion where those kinds of plays are encouraged or really expected from her at all. She is one of those champs that relies a lot on her utility to be able to help out the rest of the team. She's an enchanter, you know, her entire kit is built around making the rest of her teammates better, but when she is actively setting up plays through her use of her very limited and honestly difficult to pull off CC in a lot of these major team fights, that is massive. I think those ultimates were obviously very clutch, very crucial. LeBron was just excellent in this game. He has been excellent all split long, and honestly, to me, there is no argument right now. LeBron is the best support in the LEC. He is the best support in Europe. Mickey X has just not even been remotely close to that mark, and LeBron overtakes him because of that, but this was a great game number two from him. Ice, obviously, did a great job of following up on the stuff that LeBrov created. I think this was almost the opposite of what we saw out of him in game number one, where we criticized his inactivity, his ability to kind of just sit back and not really do much. 
That was something that I thought really hurt this team in game number one. Well, here in game two, they were super active on the Lucian Nami. You need to be basically an assassin on this champion, and that's exactly what Ice was. He was ducking in and out of fights, you know, constantly focusing priority targets and really making life a lot more difficult for things like the Jinx and the Jax in particular on the other side. So credit to Ice. Shao was really good. His pathing was excellent in this game, and that's something that I think has really improved throughout the year. He was looking a little bit lost, I would say, at the beginning of the split. They didn't really have a clear direction for, I think, where they wanted to go with a lot of their plays in the early game, but I think the more this team has played with each other, the more they figured out what they want to do. The cleaner Shale has gotten in terms of his early game, and I think prioritizing that Lucian Nami very aggressively in the early game really helped. Nuke and Adam were also generally fine, certainly not bad at all. Adam in particular, I thought, had a couple of good moments on the Gragas, but this was Ice and Lebrov as the carries, and Shao I thought really was the one who kind of facilitated that for them. So that's really nice to see. Tying up the series is big for them, and, you know, G2 is not going to be super concerned with this loss. I think they're going to look at this more as a setback than as a horrible situation to be in. You still trust yourself to win two of the final three games against this team, but there are real problems that G2 has right now, and none of them, in my opinion, are bigger than Mickey X in the support position, who has truly been dreadful throughout this split. He has been a bottom two, bottom three support in the LEC at absolute best. In terms of the individual performances he's been putting out, I think a lot of it has been hidden because, again, the rest of this team is really good. I think Caps and Yike obviously are the best jungle mid duo in the entire league by a gigantic margin. Broken Blade's been playing better. I think even Hansama has been playing better, but this bot lane still has been a weakness, even with Hans playing better because Mickey just runs it down every single game in the laning phase. I don't really know what's going on. It reminds me so much of 2022 Excel Mickey X. I got a lot of criticism and pushback for talking about his time, his half a split on Excel as a huge negative for him, as the worst he's played in his professional career, as a, a support that actively cost them a world spot. I've gotten a lot of pushback in the comments section on that in the past, but I think people are seeing firsthand what I was talking about in 2022 when Mickey's not locked in, when he's not focused, when he's not playing well, this is what you get. You get a player that is actively even losing teams for the best team in the entire region, or losing games, I should say, for the best team in the entire region, and that's really bad to see. It's, he wasn't the only one to play bad. I'm not going to sit here and say it was entirely his fault, but he certainly was the biggest culprit for sure here in Game 2, and he has been for every single one of G2's losses over the course of this split. And then Broken Blade was also not particularly good on the top side, just was never really relevant on the Cassante. We've seen that champion actually not be super relevant in the playoffs, basically in any region that we've covered here. It's certainly kind of an interesting development from it being the most broken thing in the game. It's still very relevant because it just has so many different modes, but it's not going to be able to take over games in the same kind of way. It's not inevitable in the same way it was half a year ago. Caps was still excellent here. He still was trying his best to 1v9 carry this game, but he was on Talia. It's just not a champion that you can really 1v9 on unless you are super far ahead, which he wasn't. Hansama was fine, I guess, but was taken out pretty early in a lot of these fights by the Lucian, who was just more relevant, and Yike tried his best again on the Jack but, you know, he was taking a lot of damage in that same vein. Mickey X, though, running it down, actively costing G2 a game here. I'm not going to sit here and say that he could potentially cost them more, but there is a reason that I'm not super excited about this team heading into MSI. I think if this bot lane plays like they have in the isolated 2v2, Mickey in particular, there's just no way for them to be able to hold up against the best bot lanes in the world at an international tournament. But right now, they've got to focus on getting through this series. It's all tied up at one apiece, and as you guys know, when it's tied up one-to-one, -one, I think game number three becomes the most important game in the entire series. Winning that momentum, making sure that you only have to win one of the final two, it's the most important thing that you can do now, so you have to lock in, and you have to try. Both of these teams desperately want and need to win this third game, so who's going to be able to take it? Well, the winner of game number three was... G2 Esports. They are going to take game number three. They're going to retake control of this series by going up two to one and putting themselves on finals point. They only need one more win in order to get themselves into their second straight LE, well, I guess their third straight LEC finals. If you continue from last year for BDS, you're now on the ropes. And I'm going to be honest, this game was not even remotely close. I don't even know how I can talk about this for, you know, six or seven minutes. I don't know if I'm going to fit a full segment into that because this was a 21 minute absolute absolute slaughter from the side of G2. Both of these teams opting into very similar team compositions to what they had in game number one, and I don't really know why you would want to do that if you're BDS. Clearly, you were already in a, a predicament in a circumstance where you didn't feel all that good coming out of game one, and so you opt in to the low damage Varus and the Ash that clearly Lebrov doesn't pilot nearly as well as the Engager as you opt in to the Volley Bear, which hasn't been working, and you give over the Aurelian Soul, the Jinx, and the big tank on the top side of the map. This time, it's the Zac instead of the Scion, maybe not quite as internally 
tanky, not going to have nearly as much health, but is going to have a lot more utility in terms of the things that he actually offers. And so you're looking at a situation where not only are G2 playing something that they're very comfortable on, that they have a lot of experience playing on, but you are playing stuff that you're not particularly comfortable on, that don't do particularly well into your enemy team. And guess what? You got slammed because of it. It really was not even remotely close. Just a great game from G2. Player of the game for me could go to anybody. This was a 5v5 slaughter. Every single lane won. Every single circumstance ended up going in G2's favor. And so if you want to give player of the game to any of the five players, I think you can justify that. I'm going to give it to Yike on the rail because I thought he was the most active on the map. I think his ability to just be super aggro constantly everywhere, constantly making plays. I think that was the most important thing that G2 had in this game. He never took his foot off the gas. And that's kind of what you have to do as rail, especially into something like Volley Bear that is a bit known for its early aggression and its early trading power. If you are able to establish more concrete plays early game, then I think you're actually in a relatively good position with that overall. So credit to Yike. Everybody who follows the channel knows I'm a big fan of Yike. I somehow think he's underrated in terms of the community because you constantly hear him talked about as if he's in the same level as like, you know, the other mid-tier uh, junglers in the league. Like he is almost certainly number one in my eyes. He is almost certainly the best jungler in the LEC. Him and Caps have certainly established that duo. Caps is still excellent on the Aurelian Soul. Didn't have to be as aggro, as much of a 1v9 carry as he did in game number one, but he was still very good. This champion is still inevitable, and there's really not a lot you can do to stop that. Broken Blade still very good on tanks on the top side. I would expect them to continue in that regard, whether it's the Scion, whether it's the Zac, hell, even something like the Orn, I think could be pulled out. Just something he can build super tanky on and still be aggro, like still step up and tr you know, try to make a lot of these trades and changes, I think that that actually plays really into Broken Blade style. It allows him to play a lot more forward, which is something he has always liked to do as a top laner, but he can get away with it even if he doesn't have a ton of pressure from the jungle now because he can play these champions that are just a little bit more self-sustainable, like the Scion and like the Zac. And then Hans and Mickey probably had their best game in a long time here. They actually were able to do stuff in the bot lane. Chalk that up to Ice not being a very good Varus player, at least he hasn't been in this series up until this point, or chalk it up to Lebrov not looking comfortable at all on the Ash, but the lane swap definitely helping, you know, a wild call here from G2, certainly out of the page of FPX versus Ninjas in Pajamas, but uh, it ended up working. Hans got super ahead and Mickey was a lot more relevant on the Lulu than he ever was on the Nautilus in game number two. So credit to G2, they did everything they were supposed to do in this game, but BDS just got slaughtered. Never once was remotely close. This game never really felt like they were even uh, allowed to play at any point. Like, it, it just was not good. Dead of the game, again, could probably go to any of the five. I don't think anybody played well on the side of BDS, but I'm going to give it to Adam. 7 and 0 is, is pretty bad on the Aatrox, especially when you're going into a tank. You want to be able to at least establish some kind of pressure as an early game champion like Aatrox, something that does want to try and skirmish early. He just never really was able to do that. Never played aggressively enough. Did was you know did receive some attention, I would say, from jungle, but for the most part was just bad in his own right. But you could say the same thing about the rest of the team. Lebrov is very lucky that he didn't get dead of the game here. He was awful on the Ash, at least in terms of the mechanics. Whether you want to talk about his shot calling and his macro, that's up to you. But the mechanics that he has on that champion are clearly just not good enough to be able to play in like a winner's finals capacity. Ice was not particularly impactful on the Varus, just like in game number one. Nuke just got run around by the Aurelian Soul. I get that Azir isn't also not an early game champion. Like you're not going to be able to contest a lot of the skirmishing. You're not going to be able to outdo Aurelian Soul in that regard. However, you have to at least try because Aurelian Aurelian Soul is going to outscale the Azir, at least in terms of raw damage and raw power, especially with Caps being the one playing it. And Shale lost pressure so early on in the game that there was literally nothing he could do to recover it. This is just not a good game overall for BDS. Really no good takeaways. You have to be able to rebound mentally, though. Hopefully you're going to be back on blue side. That has definitely been the stronger side throughout every single region in the playoffs up until this point. I think it gives you a much better draft. You just can't really allow G2 to get all of the things they want, again, because they are going to dominate every phase of the game. For G2, you just massively occurred this team, and you are clearly the best team in the league. You want to close this out in four. You don't want to make this interesting. You don't want this to go to a game number five. So are they going to be able to close it out in four, or is BDS going to keep this series alive, going to show that blue side is incredibly strong and push it to a game five? Well, the winner of game number four was... G2 Esports. They are going to take game number four. They are going to close out this series in four games, and they will be moving on to the LEC Finals for a third straight split. Obviously, this isn't a huge surprise. This isn't a huge upset, but BDS actually played them really tough in this series, and to me, it kind of did prove a bit more about BDS being able to take game two, you know, having a big lead both in game one and in game four, just not being able to hang on. There are some things I would say to take away from this that are positive 
positive overall for them, but G2 is just better than they are, and they're better than everybody else in the region, and so when you get to a spot like this, where you just have to rely on the best player in the game to either bring your team back or to close out the game as quickly as possible, you're gonna lose that against a team like G2, and it just is what it is, so credit to G2, they knew their win condition, but I'm really not sold that this team is super elite in the grand scheme of things. Obviously, they are better than everybody else in the LEC, but can they compete with other teams from the LCK and the LPL? I don't think this series did a lot to dissuade my idea that that answer is probably going to be no. There are certainly real problems with this team, especially in the early game. They just get bailed out so much because they have the best player in European League of Legends history, that of course being Caps in the mid lane, who's going to get player of the game, he's going to get player of the series, there's just not much else we can say about him at this point. This is truly like 2019, 2020 caps back from the grave. And it's really good to see. Not that he's been bad at all over the past few years. He's still been one of the best players in the LEC, but he's not been the unanimous MVP, clearly the best player in Europe, like he was in his prime when G2 was dominating, making world finals, winning MSI. Like that version of G2, caps was a top five player in the world at his absolute best. I'm not saying that he's absolutely that now because I think the competition level of what he's going up against on a game-to-game -game basis is a tad bit lower, but he is dominating the league like he was in his prime. Like, this is the same kind of performance you would see out of prime caps just a couple of years ago, and so that's really great to see. He's obviously phenomenal on carries, but to see him be able to pull the game back and win it essentially for his team on the Talia, like, it's really impressive stuff. We talked about it a bit in Game 3, but sometimes putting your best player on something that's a little bit more of a facilitator can both help and hurt your team. I really like flexing Rek'Sai into the jungle. We've seen it exclusively be used top after the rework, but I think Rek'Sai jungle is still very viable, and you can still do a lot of cool things in the early game with it, especially if you've got that Talia, because you are going to be able to control the map. Unfortunately, it didn't really work out this game. This wasn't a great early game for G2, but Caps is so good in the late game fights. He's always in the right spot. He knows exactly how to control objectives that you just get to the point where all that matters is one major fight at the end of the game, because he does such a good job of delaying the inevitable. So, credit to Caps. He's just the best player in Europe right now. For my money, he is clearly the best European player of all time. I'm not even sure that's really a conversation anymore, at least in terms of legacy. I can't even imagine who you would put up against him. Perks is obviously not the most popular fella in the world right now, and Reckless, I don't think, has the same kind of resume, and, you know, Yankos was, you know, really hit, uh, at his best, I would say, when he was on a team with Caps, and so it's really hard to for me to make an argument that he's not the greatest European League of Legends player of all time, but uh, he just continues to get better and better, and it really does feel like Prime Caps is returning for 2024. The rest of this team was also fine, especially in the back half. Mickey on Janna was honestly pretty good. He was really struggling in lane in the previous games, not only in this series, but obviously this year. We We've talked about it extensively in this series already. Put him on something like Janna, well, all of a sudden, this gets a lot easier. Janna is something we've seen rise in popularity specifically in the LPL. There are a lot of players in the LPL that play a lot of this champion, and so... You know, we've seen it picked a lot more frequently. I don't think it's this unanimously fantastic pick, but I am the guy who has been banging the drum on Enchanters for a little while. I still think that they are just as strong as they were at their absolute peak. I just think people don't like playing them, and so they get underplayed in terms of the meta. But pulling out something like Janna in a circumstance where you're going up against Kai'Sa and Rakan, and you want to apply a little bit of pressure in the early game, you still want to be useful in the back half of games. You want to facilitate an Aphelios or a Talia or a Rek'Sai to be able to carry in terms of damage. I think Janna does a really good job of that. She He's going to still be very useful and still going to be very difficult to deal with. So probably Mickey X's best game of the series up until this point. Uh, Hans, Broken Blade, Yike, they were all fine, I would say. I wish they had better early games, specifically the top side of this map. Broken Blade, I think, is generally very good on Scion, and I've actually grown to really like him on weak side. I think it's really a role that he has started to adapt very well. I've talked about this in previous years a lot. He used to exclusively be a top side player when he was in North America or when, when he was on Shalka. He really was exclusively somebody that needed resources and needed jungle attention in order to be relevant in the back half of games, but I think he's really grown a lot as a player since joining G2, and I think, you know, playing things like Scion, playing more weak side, that's definitely a good example of that, and Yike was generally fine. Again, I like the Rek'Sai pick in theory, it just didn't end up working out, but Caps was so good, Mickey actually had a really big impact on the back half of this game, that was enough to get G2 over the hump and to get them into finals, so congratulations to them. They've already qualified for MSI by winning winter, but they could do so as the team that gets to skip the play-ins if they do end up continuing this win streak, but for BDS, they move down into the lower bracket now, they're going to take on the winner of the series that we're going to talk about next in this video. 
And like I said, it's really hard to be, like, entirely frustrated with this team. They had a really good game plan, and honestly, they should have won this game in the same way that they should have won game number one. There were multiple moments in this series where if they just didn't bottle it down the stretch, they probably might be going to the finals, right? You could talk about three games that they should have won in this series. The problem is, uh, should have doesn't really count. If you throw leads in the late game, then you're not... You're not winning those games, and so it is a little bit frustrating, I understand. From the side of BDS, a couple of pretty big underperformances, I would say, in this final game, number four. Dud of the game for me is going to go to Adam. He's just off his game right now. Ever since he came back in at the start of spring, I do think it's the worst he's played in the LEC. I'm not exactly going to sit here and say that this was like a horrible, horrible split, or this was a horrible, horrible series for him. I just don't think it's up to his standard. He was outclassed by Broken Blade, and that's honestly something that we haven't seen super regularly from Adam. Even in his bad matchups, he he usually is able to survive and be useful in the late game, but he just wasn't very good in this series on some more aggressive picks as well. Things that, you know, typically you would think would allow him to be more of the Adam that we know and love in lane and out of lane. And so it is a little bit surprising and a little bit frustrating to see it just not work out for him, but you would have to hope that it's just a little bit of a bump in the road. Uh, I think everybody else was relatively fine in this game. Maybe you wanted to see LeBrov go in a bit less in the back half of games, maybe get caught out a bit less, but he got ice super fed. And so for the most part, it was worth it. They just couldn't capitalize on all all the gold that was on the Kaisa, which is definitely frustrating. You, once again, have a comp that is built to win 5v5 team fights, and yet you get to this stage of the game where you're going into Talia, Rek'Sai, and you can't win. It's certainly got to be frustrating for BDS, but you just have to look back and say, well, Caps was the best player in the game, and that's why we lost. If we had better control over objectives, if we did a better job of actually being able to push our tempo when we got those two Barons, then perhaps we walk out of this game with a win, but it's just not meant to be. They're going to go down into the semifinals, into the lower bracket. They still have an opportunity to get to MSI, you know, depending on what happens in the series that we talk about next, you know, the conversation surrounding that could be a lot more interesting depending on who wins between Fnatic and Vitality, but at least for now, the clearest path that they have to getting to an international tournament here is to win the semifinals, is to win their next series and to get their rematch with G2. With the way they played here, I'm pretty optimistic that they're going to at least be favorites going into a series like that, but you never really know what the LEC upsets are so common, but for G2, very, very nice series. Caps is an absolute monster, and there's just no other way to look at them right now than as the major favorites to win the LEC once again. And then moving on now to the final series that we are going to cover in today's video. That's, of course, going to be the lower bracket in round number three. The winner of this series will move on to take on BDS in the semifinals for an opportunity, of course, to not only play in the LEC finals, but to make MSI. And depending on which team ends up advancing... They could have one or two more series to go after this before they officially qualify, but this is the first step for both of them. It's the top two seeds going into the playoffs, the number one seeded Fnatic taking on the number two seeded Team Vitality. And so I'm very interested in this matchup. The two teams that I guess theoretically performed the best in the regular season. I don't think anyone ever considered these two the favorites to win it or anything, but obviously very interesting to see them go head to head in a matchup where one of them has to be eliminated, but both of them making the best of five stage. I think they consider that, you know, obviously a good thing as we talked about earlier on in the episode. How do these two teams stack up against each other, though? Well, I think there are clear advantages and disadvantages. I think the most important matchup is clearly, to me, going to be the bot lane. Noah and June taking on Karzi and Hillisang. I think both of these bot lanes can be rather volatile, and if either steps up and plays super well over the course of the entire series, that team is almost certainly going to be able to win. If Fnatic put a lot of attention and a lot of resources into trying to get Noah ahead, if this bot lane can continue the good form ascent that they've kind of been on over the past couple of weeks, and I think Fnatic's going to be in a really good spot, because Karzi and Hilly aren't exactly a good bot lane at playing from behind, but they are a really good bot lane at playing from ahead. Hilly is, you know, for all his flaws, very good at being able to generate leads for his team. Whether or not he does a great job of keeping those leads is up to your interpretation, but... He is phenomenal at being able to play aggro and get, you know, gold and resources for his AD carry or his jungler or his mid laner or even himself in a lot of different circumstances, whoever needs to be funneled in that particular game. And Karzi is certainly the kind of player that can do a lot of good things from ahead. He's just not as consistent at all from behind as an AD carry. And so I really do think whoever is able to get the jump in terms of the bot lane is likely going to win this series. I think that is a super important lane matchup. But you look at the top lane, that should be pretty Team Vitality favorite. 
favored Photon should just straight up be better than Oscar Rinnan. You would imagine that that is actually not a particularly close matchup. Photon, I have a couple of tiers ahead of Oscar as a top laner. So that's, I think, where Vitality can definitely generate a lot of their own advantages. But then, you know, Jungle Mate, I think, theoretically should be in favor of Fnatic, specifically this jungle matchup. Even though Razork has not been perfect over the past few weeks, Daglas is certainly somebody that has never played at this kind of level before. This is his first best of five at the top level in Europe. That is a big ask to go up against a player like Razork, who has been here time and time again. But the mid lane matchup is just as interesting, in my opinion. You've got Humanoid and VTO, and this could also be kind of a swing point for this series. Humanoid has not been nearly as hot as he was in winter, and I think that that has definitely cooled off Fnatic a bit, at least towards the end of the regular season. In the playoffs here, it's the reason I don't think they were able to even remotely touch a G2 in their series, is that Humanoid needed to be one of the best players in that series, and he just simply wasn't. And VTO, to his credit, has also cooled off a bit, I would say, going into the spring split. However, both of them for different reasons. VTO has taken a bit more of a facility facilitator role. Uh, Photon, Karzy have definitely been more of the primary carries for what Vitality have wanted to do, whereas Humanoid I just don't think has been as active in these games. I think mid lane could be a big turning point for both of these teams. I think bot lane could be a big turning point for both of these teams. Where do I have it predicted? Well, I didn't actually get a chance to predict it, obviously, because I covered their previous series in this episode, but I would have predicted Fnatic. They were much higher in my power rankings. I've had them at number two in my power rankings for basically the entirety of the spring split. I really don't have a reason to believe that they're not going to be the better team here, Vitality, to their credit, I think has overperformed, but we're not even sold that they are guaranteed a top four team. You know, Heretics kind of got unlucky with the draw having to face Fnatic in the previous round. It would have been a lot more interesting to me to see Heretics take on Vitality. I think that raises more question marks, but Fnatic should be favorites going into the series. I think they will see it as a bit of a disappointment if they don't walk out of this with a win. But of course, getting a win starts with game number one. So let's go ahead and go game by game. And the winner of game number one was... Team Vitality, they are going to take the first game of this series. They're going to go up one to nothing, and this was an action-packed game. 38 kills for Vitality in 31 minutes. They were certainly not playing it safe. But that's where Vitality is at their best, when they're constantly looking for these plays, whether they are good plays or bad plays, just going for it over and over and over again. You've got a lot of really talented mechanical players, and really the flaw in this team is that you don't really have a lot of players that have been known for their good macro over the course of their careers. You know, I'm not going to say that players like Photon and VTO are stupid, but Karzy and Hilly as a bot lane, always known not only as a duo, but separately as two very aggressive players that are constantly going to be looking to take 50-50s and to be pushed forward, and so getting a a lot of aggression down in the bot lane, I think, is a positive. And then Daglas is another player who the scouting report on him was very aggressive coming out of Vitality B. And so to see that kind of carry over here into this playoff series, at least in game number one, it really worked for them. For Fnatic, I really hate this draft. I think you have almost no win condition in the back half of this game unless Diana is super fed. And it is so difficult to get Diana fed in terms of how this composition is really operating. And so I really, really do not like this draft. I imagine that they're going to pivot and go to something different throughout the rest of this series. But I think they put themselves in a pretty big hole in game number one that they just couldn't quite dig themselves out of. Player of the game for me is going to go to Hillisang in this support position. I know this is maybe more of a controversial opinion because Karzy, VTO, even Daglas all played super well in this game, but I don't think they generate nearly as many advantages in my opinion without Hillisang playing as aggressively as he did on the Rumble support. Of course, this is a pick that has risen in popularity throughout the year. Life over in the LPL for FPX has made it a pretty popular one, has certainly popularized it. I would say maybe hasn't introduced it, but certainly made it kind of a, a noteworthy pick and we've seen the strength that, that it can put out on enemy teams in the LPL and Hillisang is kind of the perfect example of a player that I think would excel on it here in the LEC, and that's exactly what he did. Now, was he a little bit too far forward sometimes? Absolutely. There were one or two deaths in this game where you can actively point and be like, what are you doing? Like, why are you there? Where, like, what is your goal? Like, what is the thought process? But the good plays were the best plays in the game, in my opinion. So Hilly is going to get the player of the game, even though it is a little bit variable in game number one. Karzy was also excellent, I would say, in this one on the Varus. Didn't really have to create a ton of his own action throughout this game. Was mostly just kind of a beneficiary of what Hilly and Douglas were creating even VTO with those point and click charms. You know, we'll talk about that in a bit, but uh, I thought his positioning was just a little bit over aggressive in some of these fights. He missed a couple of Varus ultimates. He just wasn't as clinical as maybe you would want with the lead that he had. It didn't really matter because Varus from ahead is really difficult to deal with, especially going into Callista Ash, who's just not going to have any prio if they lose in the early game. And so it's hard to take away the fact that he was still super relevant in this game. I just don't think his individual plays were all that great. Same thing for VTO. Like, I really liked how we played the early game, but then you get to some of these team fights and he's missing two charms in one fight and he's not really having that big 
big of an impact. It's not really something you would expect out of Vitio, who is, in my uh, estimation and opinion, the best RE player in the LEC. Maybe not named Caps because he's the best everything player in the LEC, but Vitio is an excellent RE player, and while he was able to generate that lead early, he didn't exactly capitalize on it in the same way that maybe you would want to see him capitalize on it. Daglas, Photon, both had their own issues. Daglas, I think, generally was fine, especially considering the role that he played here. He got an early lead for Vitality and just kind of snowballed the game, even if that champion wasn't super relevant in the back half. It's Volibear. He's not really supposed to be. And then Malphite. A couple of missed Malphite ultimates from Photon. Uh, not really in character for him, but again, the champion is so relevant, even if you miss the ultimate, that it's really hard to kind of blame him, especially into this comp with Callista, Vi, Ash, you know, Cassante. Like, so many tools that you kind of just shut down if you're the Malphite. So, credit to Vitality. I think their draft was significantly better, and I think they won because of that. But for Fnatic... Like I said earlier, honestly, they just put themselves in such a big hole, in my opinion, when it came to draft. I think they really put themselves in the worst possible situation. I think the Diana pick is just bad in this particular instance. I understand the Wombo combo that you could potentially pull off. You hit one Ash Arrow, Vi, Diana, even Cassante. I'll jump on top of that person. You can get picks really easily in this comp, but there's just no real way for the Diana to get the ball rolling. And when you look at the late game output of this team, like where is your damage supposed to come from in a 5v5, especially into Rumble support or Malphite? Like, they can force a lot of these engages a lot easier than you can, and also you don't have the damage to be able to back up or peel out of a lot of these circumstances. I think this is honestly just really poor drafting from Fnatic, and they really struggled because of it. Rightfully so, I think the dud of the game is going to go to Humanoid. Now, it's not entirely his fault. I want to point out that a lot of the problems that I think he individually ran into in this game were the champion and not so much the individual plays that he made, but that's his fault to an extent that he picked Diana. He was really useless in this game. This champion did absolutely nothing thing, and it never was going to do anything. I think that's the most frustrating part, is I just don't really see an avenue where Diana is useful in this particular game, and I think Humanoid definitely felt that the hard way. Noah is also somebody to point out as having a really, really terrible game. His positioning on Callista was horrible. He was tickling the front line by the end of the game, and honestly, his target prioritization in some of those late-game fights could have cost them a couple of really important circumstances. They were behind by a lot, but Vitality was making mistakes. They were leaving opportunities open for Fnatic to get them back into the game, and Noah just did a really poor job, I think, of capitalizing on those opportunities that were essentially handed to him. June wasn't very good on Ash. That's been a recurring trend, I would say, throughout this year up until this point. Uh, um, Oscar was bad, again, on Cassante. This isn't particularly normal. Uh, that's easily his best champion. One of the big scouting report things for me on Fnatic is just ban Cassante because he's really not all that good on anything else. Maybe Rek'Sai has been kind of the other big pick for him, but outside of those two champions, he has been essentially useless on everything else. I don't understand why you wouldn't just perma-ban out those champions. I guess you're afraid of the Zeri Rel combo, but uh, you know you could even beat Oscar's Cassante. Like, if, if that's going to be a problem, that's concerning for Fnatic, and Razork couldn't exactly do anything after the ball stopped rolling for Fnatic, even though I really don't think he was all that bad in this game. It just was a really bad situation and circumstance for them to put themselves in. And I think they lost because of it. Now you're going into game two down 0-1, and that's a really bad place to be. If Vitality can win this game too, all of a sudden 2-0, you're in a dominant spot. You only have to win one of the final three games. That's a great spot for Vitality, who I think came into this kind of as the underdogs. And for Fnatic, you really don't want to go down 0-2. Vitality can win almost any game. Their aggressiveness is clearly going to be a bit of a problem. You need to be able to match in the early game or alternatively, alternatively give yourself something to play out the late game with because you just didn't have that in this comp. So it's going to be interesting to see the adaptations, but we're going to figure out if the series is going to go to 2-0 or 1-1 here in game number two. Can Fnatic fight back or is Vitality going to take a commanding lead? Well, the winner of game number two was... Fnatic, they are going to take game number two. They're going to tie up the series at one to one, and obviously a pretty necessary win for them going down 0-2 would have been kind of a disaster, but man, I got to point out, this series has been a banger. I don't know if it's because they're both playing really poorly or if it's because they're both playing really well, but 100 plus kills through two games is, is pretty insane. Uh, the aggression being shown between these two teams is genuinely unfathomable. I did not expect this series to be like this. Maybe I could have anticipated something like this from Bayern. Vitality, but Fnatic doesn't really feel like the kind of roster that would match this kind of pace, but that's exactly what we're getting. Another 50 kill game coming in here from these two teams, and 100 plus kills through the first two is genuinely ridiculous. We'll see if this pace can keep up through the final games of this series. At the very least, we're going to four or five, so we could be seeing a 200 plus kill series overall here between these two teams, but a really, really fun game number two. I would say back and forth, but it really kind of wasn't. There were moments where Vitality looked like they were going to be in it, and there were moments where 
where it's like, oh, Karzi has a lot of damage. Oh, VTO can potentially move around the map and create more chaos. But they did exactly kind of what I wanted to see from them. The Fnatic, that is, uh, did exactly what I wanted to see from them in game number two, which is index a lot more into these late game resources that are just going to be relevant, essentially, no matter where the game state is at. Things like Zaya, Azir are very common as a duo, or at least they have been in the history of professional League of Legends. And there's a reason for that. Zaya can have pressure early. She can compete because her damage is pretty high in the early game. However, she doesn't need to because she does scale incredibly well in that same vein. Her numbers aren't exactly where they used to be, but they can still be really, really good. And that's exactly what we saw from Noah. And the Azir is obviously just something that is universally useful in the back half of games. Add a Jax onto that, a Blitzcrank for some playmaking potential. You have more options, I would say, in this game. And I think they capitalized on it well. Player of the game is going to go to June for me. You know, we'll get to some of the other players on this team, namely the, the goaded duo here of Razork and Humanoid who have returned to their 2022-2023 form in terms of what they are looking like in late-game teamfights, but June saved this game on multiple occasions as the Blitzcrank. There were multiple moments where I think this game is insta-lost if June just doesn't go out there and actually just win fights or grab priority targets or peel off for his AD carry. Like, there were so many moments where you just watch this and you go, a worse support would have probably lost this game, but June was excellent here and he has been on a ridiculously good run of form as of late. We talked about, you know, the bot lanes being very important for this series. We saw that in game one with Hilly's aggressiveness coming through on the Rumble. I think the same thing can be said here for June on the Blitzcrank. I think if they are going to be able to dominate and bring these kinds of performances through the rest of this series, that is a great sign for Fnatic that they're going to be able to win it. Noah was obviously great in that same vein. Couple of missed positions. He can sometimes just be too aggressive, be too far forward. We've seen that in the past. It's honestly kind of the opposite of the problem he had last year where he was way too passive, really didn't give over a lot of things, but also wasn't gaining as many resources as maybe some of the best AD carries in Europe were. I think we've kind of transitioned into a more aggressive bot lane. Perhaps it's because they feel more comfortable with each other now, but Noah was very aggressive in this game, and it did work out for most of this game, especially in the later team fights. I do have to criticize Razork and Humanoid, though. I know I've been very complimentary of them over the course of this year, but I'm not going to sit here and forget what it looked like in 2022 and 2023, where I did criticize these two as a duo very heavily, and one of the reasons I said in this offseason that I was surprised that both of them were coming back is just because it didn't feel like they ever had great chemistry, I should say, as a duo. And honestly, that's kind of what we saw here. Just a couple of really big misplays. I know the score lines look okay, but Razork had a couple of really bad plays in the mid game that almost cost his team the entirety of the map pressure they had done a really good job generating. And then Humanoid with one of the single worst cases of LEC Azir syndrome I've ever seen in my entire life. Again, I know I talk about this a lot, but LEC Azir syndrome is truly a menace right now in Europe and you don't have to go for the Shuriman shuffle every single fight. Sometimes you can actively do damage. Like the champion is meant to do damage. You don't have to be the engage tool on a team with Blitzcrank, Jax, and Rek'Sai. It is just so preposterous to me the only real way that I can describe it is it, it's like hero ball. It's like when you watch an NBA game and you see one player just constantly trying to, you know, take these isolations and, and, and constantly just checking up threes because he has to save the game himself. You don't have to do that. If you're humanoid, you've got a team around you that is very strong. You've got engage tools. You've got ways to peel off your backline. Just do your job. But it, I'm sorry, this was just a bad game from humanoid and that doesn't translate into the scoreline. But I think he was one of the worst players in this entire game. And that's the first two games where I think he has been genuinely not good for Fnatic, like the worst player in this series up until this point. And so it's really not exciting to see that. I think he tried his best to lose some of these fights for his team, but at the end of the day, they were able to win him because again, June and Noah were really far ahead. I also think Oscar was really good in the back half of this game, which I didn't really expect. Rexai is not one of those champions that you're really anticipating a lot out of in late game team fights, but I think Oscar did a good job. Overall, it was enough for Fnatic to be able to pick up the win, but man, did they try to throw it away at a couple of key points. And then for Vitality, you know, they, they tried their best to keep their foot on the gas and there were moments where it looked okay. Again, I think Daglas is actually playing relatively well at being able to capitalize on mistakes. And Karzi, I think to his credit, did his best as an immobile AD carry going into Blitzcrank, who is playing well and not only Blitzcrank, but a, uh, an Azir that is looking bloodthirsty in a lot of these fights and a, a Jax and a Rek'Sai and a lot of these tools that can jump on you. Like it's not easy to play Varus in these matchups. And I think he did a lot of damage in these fights, but there just wasn't enough firepower. Dead of the game is going to go to Photon. I honestly didn't expect 
expect Photon to be as useless as he's been. Through the first two games, he has been such a positive, such a menace for Vitality, in my opinion. Clearly the best top laner in the LEC over the course of this year, and that's not really translated to this series up until this point. The Jace just didn't really get to do anything, especially being given R5, being that quote-unquote counterpick into Rek'Sai, being able to actually match it in the early laning phase. You have to be relevant, or at least more relevant than the Rek'Sai throughout the entirety of the game, and that just didn't really happen for Photon, so you are a bit concerned about that, but I really honestly don't think that there are too many major issues for Vitality. They just gave over too many big plays to Fnatic, and I want to give more credit to the players who played well on Fnatic and also criticize the players who didn't play well rather than sit here and point at Vitality. This is much more expected. Fnatic actually drafted a comp they could execute on in the late game, and they were able to win because of it because they are kind of the better of these two teams. Now, is that going to stay true throughout the entirety of the series? There's really only one way to find out because, of course, Game 3 now, tied up at 1-1, becomes the most important game in the series, being able to reestablish that pressure if your vitality or gain control of the series if your fanatic is massive winning this game number three is likely going to translate to who has the pressure for the rest of the series so big game number three here who's going to be able to take it well the winner of game number three was fanatic they are going to take game number three they're going to go up in this series two to one and this was a dominant performance again very aggressive stuff coming out from fanatic they clearly had a game plan this week and that was to capitalize on the mistakes that vitality were inevitably going to make typically speaking vitality is able to generate so many of their advantages clear just simply by being very talented by being mechanically intensive and by having very good players even if they don't necessarily have the best macro in the entire world and fanatic was very aware of that fact and they clearly came in to try and take advantage of it they said hey we have good mechanics we're very talented why don't we just kind of take their game to them why don't we start taking a lot of these crazy fights why don't we just engage every single time we see a member of vitality and why don't we just try to dominate them in the early game and kind of push them out of their own style and that's exactly what they did they are just as talented if not more so than a team like vitality they they can be just as aggressive as a team like vitality and that's it's going to be a positive for them, and it really does take away a lot of the advantages that Vitality typically has over other teams. So, credit to Fnatic. It is a really interesting game plan and game style, but it's clearly working out for them as another 26 kills on the board, this time in a 24-minute game uh, for Fnatic. It, it truly is getting ludicrous and ridiculous how many kills these teams are getting in these games, but this was the biggest blowout of all of them. For Vitality, again, it just felt like you got taken off your game super early and were never really able to recover. This was not a good mid-game from them. They were constantly out of position. Uh, they didn't really see a fight that they didn't want to take, even from super far behind. And even in 5v5s, when you're looking at Ori and Senna and, you know, Sejuani, these champions that from behind do just kind of want to scale into the late game. There still was an avenue to me to get back into this game, but he just kind of threw that all away in the mid game by taking fight after fight after fight. And I think it really did cost them. It's a really good read by Fnatic and really bad adaptation from Vitality. But we'll go ahead and talk about how we ended up getting there. Player of the game for me is pretty obviously going to go to Razork. I think a lot of people are going to want to see Humanoid or even Noah or Oscar or June or any of these five get it. But Razork took over this game. When you watch his pathing, when you watch his ability to just kind of cut off a lot of the plays that Vitality wanted to make, it was very clear to me that he was the most influential member of Fnatic in this game. Whether or not you want to say that he was by far the best in terms of mechanics or execution, I think that's up to you. But his aggression was very, very much on display. There was definitely not a fight that Razork didn't like and you know what he didn't really get punished for it at any point throughout this game credit to him because he he understood I think that Daglas isn't exactly going to match him in terms of the pressure that he's able to put out in the early game and so he just kept pulling the trigger over and over and every single lane got super fed because of it there were a lot of these 3v3 or 4v4 skirmishes a lot earlier than you would typically see them for a team not only like Fnatic but just a team in the LEC like this was just a really interesting game plan and Razork to me was the spearhead of that game plan. He just was unkillable throughout a lot of this game. His engages were excellent for the team, so credit to Razork. They needed that, but Humanoid really was the damage follow-up for a lot of these plays. He was constantly moving around the map easily, in my opinion. The best game that he has played all series up until this point. I do think he could stand to be a bit more aggressive to match the rest of the pace of the team. I do think there were times where he was playing it safer than the rest of them, but I honestly think that's generally fine, and that was kind of what I was complaining about in game two, was that he was too aggressive, and so if you are going to kind of take your foot off the gas, then 
And I think this was a pretty good way to do it. Just play Ari and capitalize on the engages that the rest of your team are making rather than feeling like you have to be the primary facilitator yourself. I think he did a great job of capitalizing on that. Uh, Noah and June continue to look like the better bot lane. Senna Tom Kench really does need time to scale. And like I said, with Fnatic's foot on the gas with their pedal to the metal in this one, they just never really were going to have time to scale. And so you've got this Varus Recon that can be big playmakers, big, you know, skirmishers in the mid game if you really need them to be. And that's exactly what Noah and June did. Oscar was also deathless on Zach, which at times can be easy. At times can be not easy. I mean, you're jumping into the fray. There are going to be times where you're going to obviously have to put yourself in at least a little bit of danger. But his ability to move around the map and, and be more active, like these 5v5s, like I said earlier, were taken a lot earlier in the game than you would traditionally see them because Oscar was trying to move out of top lane. They were trying to force these clumps a lot quicker in this game. And I think that definitely benefited Fnatic. So I think everybody really did their job. Everybody stepped up and did exactly what they needed to do in this game. I think Razork was kind of the spearhead in terms of the plays that they were making and the decisions that they were making, the aggressiveness that they were showing. But I think you can generally look at everybody on this team as having a very good game. That's what happens when you blow out a team like Vitality. But for Vitality on the other side, you just draft a, a late game scaling comp that you don't really have a lot of tools to execute on. I understand the idea behind, okay, these games are going late. They're very bloody. You know, we're going to get resources typically, you know, with how the series is going, that they're going to give over some kills in the early to mid game that are going to get, you know, some of the scaling pieces a lot further ahead than maybe you would anticipate in a normal circumstance, but that did kind of end here in game number three. Your mistakes were taken advantage of a lot more in this game than they were in previous games, and I think generally you just didn't really have a good answer to the aggression and the pace that Fnatic was showing in this. Dead of the game could go to almost anybody. I very much considered Karzi for this one on the Senna because I thought he played horrible. I very much considered VTO on the Orianna because I think he was also really bad, but I'm going to give it to Photon. Not being involved in a single kill when the game was this centralized is really not a good sign. Like, I'm not trying to sit here and say that as a top laner you're supposed to be involved in everything, but it's not like this was a traditional game where top laners are kind of on their own for the first 20 minutes and eventually you get to this part of the game where they're splitting and also grouping and, you know, they're always going to have lower KP, like that kind of thing. This was a lot more of a grouped up game than you would traditionally see out of two team comps like this. Aatrox had opportunities to be relevant in some of these fights and Photon just wasn't. He has not been good at all in this series. He has not been relevant at all, which is certainly frustrating because I do think this team does rely on him a little bit more than the average team relies on their top laner. This just was not a good showing from him. But like I said, VTO was not good. Karzi and Hilly, I thought were very bad cards in particular, on the Senna, constantly looking for skirmishes and fights at 15 minutes on Senna. What are you expecting to happen? Like, are you expecting to win those? Are you expecting to get resources out of them? I just don't really understand the thought process or the decision-making behind some of the plays they went for. But again, Vitality's never really been praised for their macro. Their problems have always been when teams are able to actively out-pressure them and out-position themselves on the map against them. And, you know, they really didn't have an answer, and they still don't have an answer to that kind of play right now. It is is really just we either win through our mechanics or we lose through the enemy team's decision making and right now they're losing they're on the brink of elimination in this next game if they do not win they will officially be eliminated they will not have a chance to make it to MSI and they will get fourth place which would be I guess a bit disappointing after the number two seed in the regular season but Fnatic one game away from moving on to the semifinals that's exactly where they want to be of course this team wants to make MSI I think a lot of people consider them you know a top two at worst top three team in the LEC and so this is a big game for both teams can Vitality stay alive or is Fnatic going to be able to close this out in four? Well, the winner of game number four was... Fnatic. They are going to take game number four. They are going to close out this series in four games and they will be moving on to the semifinals to take on BDS. Vitality, unfortunately, that means that with this loss, they are officially eliminated from the playoffs. They are eliminated from MSI contention. Not a particularly shocking way for this series to end, but uh, I, it is a blast. I mean, this was an absolute banger of a series. There's really no other way to describe it. Both of these teams came to play today they clearly said screw macro screw decision making we are just going to fight over and over and over again and the better team is going to come out on top unfortunately for vitality that was fanatic but this was a blast this was a kill record in the lec for a best of five which is crazy because this was four games they didn't even go to a fifth game and yet they still set a kill record for an lec best of five that is genuinely unbelievable but credit to these two teams they certainly went out and tried to break that record and they succeeded, so good stuff to them. We'll talk about what this means for the playoffs moving forward, of course, at the end, but player of the game to me is going to go to Humanoid in the mid lane. 
He finally had that really, really great game, I would say, on his ear. Was still a little bit over-aggressive on this champion, more than maybe I would like, because I still would like to see him be more of a backline carry, especially when you've got Vi and Renata and Zack and a lot of these divers that can do a lot more. Renata's not really a diver, but, uh, you know, she can facilitate a lot of these plays, and that's kind of the point that I'm trying to make. Humanoid doesn't need to be the, the hero, but he still was excellent in this game in game number four. Certainly better than his counterpart on the other side of this matchup in Vitia, who had a very rough game four, a really rough series as especially down the stretch, and we'll talk about that, but it's just nice to see Humanoid actually have a very good game here. I was very critical of him throughout the first couple of games. I think you look at games one and two, and you're like, man, this is the worst player in the entire series, and that's really not a good place to be at, but games three, games four, significantly better. He did a lot of good stuff on the Ari in the previous game, and he did a lot of good stuff on the Azir here, too. I just wish that he could kind of find a middle ground of these play styles. Oftentimes, I'm either complaining about him being too aggressive or not aggressive enough like he was on the Ari in game three. I wish he could find kind of the sweet spot in the middle that would be a lot more preferable I would say overall and I think that's something that could potentially hold him back from playing against the best mid laners in the world you know like caps but at least for now this was certainly good enough to be able to get over the hump that was Vitality. Player of the series as a whole for me maybe shockingly is going to go to June in the support position. I don't think a lot of people were seeing that coming. I know Broadcast gave it to Oscar Rinnan. That's shocking to me. He was the player that I, I'm not going to say I considered the least because I really like how he played Zach at the back half of this series. Games three and four were both very good from him in terms of his ability to group up and actually force the tempo of the game to accelerate a bit, take these 5v5s a lot quicker than you would expect. But player of the series, like that is a little much for me. It certainly is not what I would have voted, but uh, I think June was excellent here. And to me, he was the most valuable player on both of these teams. I didn't really feel like he had a bad game across this entire series. Maybe you can look at game number one. The Ash wasn't perfect, but games two, three, four, he was very relevant in all those games, and he saved game number two individually, and so uh, I really, you know, I, I want to give him his flowers. I I've been very critical of June over the course of his pro career, not only here in the LEC, but of course in the LCK as well, and so it's nice to see him have a very good series when it really matters. He was very good on Renata here in game four. A couple of great ultimates. Maybe he was a little bit too far forward in a couple of circumstances, but he was still incredibly influential on the way that this game ended up turning out, and so, you know, I want to give him his credit there. I think the other player that I really consider for player of the series was Razork. And if you want to give it to Razork, I totally understand that. To me, it's like a 55-45 thing between June and Razork. Whether you want to give it to Razork or June, it's really up to you. But I'm going to give it to June. I think Razork could win it, though. You know, I criticize the Vi pick a lot on this channel, not only in the LEC, but in every region. I just don't think Vi is one of those champions that's all that consistent because she relies so much on her early game or else she's just going in and dying and not really doing anything in the late game. But Razork plays Vi so aggressively in the mid game that he is able to generate these large gold leads and he is able to get like really far ahead in terms of the items and the stats that he has which makes Vi a very difficult champion to deal with so credit to Razork he was excellent especially after game number one I think games uh, three and four in particular again for him were really really great Noah was fine. I think he did his job in this series. He was great in game two, but uh, I don't really think he was all that important towards what Fnatic did. They didn't really need him. And then same thing for Oscar. Like, I'm really glad that he was able to group up, and I'm really glad that the Zac really was a positive pick for the team overall, because it's kind of just been Cassante and Rek'Sai throughout the year for this team. Even Poppy has been kind of a negative pick, which is something Oscar played a ton of last year, and so you were a bit concerned about his ability to branch out into other champions. It's nice to see that the Zac can work in the top lane for this team. However, player of the series just feels a little bit rich to me, and I'm not really sure where that came from, but he was very good here in game number four, but this was more of a team effort. Humanoid getting back on track, June and Razork being excellent as kind of carries throughout a lot of this series in terms of the plays that they were able to make in the Noah and Oscar. Certainly not weak links. Overall, Fnatic deserved to go on to the next round, especially with the forcefulness that they did it with, and then for Vitality, if you're gonna go out, at least go out in a blaze of glory, and that's exactly what they did here. This game was kind of close. Like, there were definitely moments where Vitality could have won it. I think if VTO was better in this final game, they probably do end up winning it, and that's a very sad thing to say, but he's gonna get dud of the game here for game number four. I think he's been in eight best of fives over the course of his career, and he's won zero of them. It's not a good sign. It's certainly not something that you want to hear from a player that is so individually, mechanically talented and has had so much success in the regular season to see that he's never actually been able to win a best of five over the course of his career is certainly disappointing, and then you get performances like this, and you're like, is this somebody that can perform in clutch situations? Is he somebody that disappears when the games matter more? It's certainly a conversation to have. I'm not going to sit here and put that on him because I don't think I've necessarily thought of him like that in previous years, but it's certainly something that is now creeping into my brainwave. He was just really bad here at the end of game four. When you're doing less damage than the Sejuani in a lot of these fights, you're not really being all that useful on the Akali, and this is kind of a signature champion, or at least one of his signature champions, and so certainly one of the most disappointing things that you could see from BTO here in game number four, but 
The rest of the team was fine. Photon finally had a good game. He was really bad through the first three games, but he was excellent here in game number four. Tried his best to single-handedly win the game 1v9 for Vitality. It just wasn't enough. It's so hard to do that on Renekton, but he was doing so much in these late-game team fights. And then Karzi, obviously, too far forward in a lot of different cases. He led the team in deaths, but also, he's Zaya. He was willing to play aggressive. He was willing to play on the edge of danger, and it's hard to really criticize him for that. I think Karzi and Hilly were genuinely fine in this series, and Daglas, to me, was also fine in this series. I think you're just looking at Fnatic being able to play this style a little bit better because their hands are a little bit better, their mechanics are a little bit better, and that just is the unfortunate reality, I think, of the situation. For Vitality, you just have to hope that you can figure things out going into the offseason. I don't really think this team is going to make any changes. I think this, as a group of five, is good enough to, at the very least, make top three or top four if things were to go a lot better for them. Maybe you want to look at a new jungler. Like, that's really the only thing that I could potentially see them moving in a different direction on, but I would be surprised if this team ended up making changes. I think top four is a relatively okay outcome for them, and they've gotten better as the year has gone along. If they can continue that trend, if perhaps their macro can start to catch up to some of their fights, then I do think this could be an interesting team moving forward, but Fnatic is now moving on to the semifinals to take on BDS. The winner of that will qualify for MSI. It is as simple as that. They don't need to win the league or anything because G2 is already, you know, in the, in at MSI. They've already qualified due to their win in the winter split, so it's definitely an interesting one. We'll preview that in just a second, but congratulations to Fnatic. It's been a really good split, I would say, overall for them. A lot of these players have stepped up, and I think that culminated here in a win against Vitality. All right, but that is going to do it for my LEC Spring Playoffs Round 3 Overview and Analysis video. That's Winner's Finals. That is the lower bracket. Both of our first two uh, best of fives done and dusted. It's now just the semifinals and the finals remaining here in the LEC. We're going to get individual videos for both of these series, so I'm excited for that. Quickly to preview BDS taking on Fnatic. Um, I think this is going to be a really fun series. I don't really know who the better of these two teams in, is in the regular season. I would have felt confident saying, that it was Fnatic. I felt like they were a lot more controlled in terms of how they were playing the game in the regular season, and obviously they just put on a clinic in terms of aggressiveness in that series against Vitality, but BDS has really been stepping it up in the playoffs. I think this is by far the most interesting matchup. Remember, the winner of this auto-qualifies for MSI because of the way the championship points have laid out. These two teams are two and three in terms of championship points, and whoever wins this will become the number two team in terms of championship points, regardless of whether or not they are able to win the LEC finals. So, this is an international series qualifying match for BDS and Fnatic, and I think it's going to be a blast. If I really had to put my money on a team, I'd probably put it on BDS. I think they're the better of these two teams, but like barely. This is like a 55-45 series for me. I feel less confident about this than I did about uh, Fnatic over Vitality, which I felt pretty good about, and obviously basically any other series that we've talked about. Uh, I mean, Vitality, BDS. I felt BDS was the better team, and so I don't know. Right now, it's a really, really interesting one, but I would love to know what you guys think down in the comment section below. Who do you think is going to win? Who do you think is going to go to MSI, BDS, or Fnatic? Would love to know your thoughts and opinions down below. Of course, if you enjoyed the video, leave a like. It really does mean a lot to me. Let's me know you guys are enjoying the content, and it does help get this video out to a lot more people, which I'm always very appreciative of. If you're new here, hit the subscribe button. We don't only post about the LEC. The LCK and LPL playoffs are both also going on right now, and of course, like we said, MSI is just around the corner. If you want a comprehensive overview of everything going on in LOL Esports, this is the place for it. Hit subscribe and hit that bell so you can be notified when those videos do go live live. But of course, with all that being said, I hope you all are having a great day. I hope you continue to have a great day. And I will see you all later.